Captain America knows all about Faraday cages and grounding strategies so that his batteries are the least noisy things in the universe. Oh, it's a shame he had to do all that fighting to save the universe. He'd probably be a good electrochemist. Welcome to the Electrochemistry Podcast, where we discuss all things electrochemistry. I'm your host, Dr. Alex Peroff, and with me is my co-host, Dr. Neil Spinner. On today's podcast, we are introduced to Jing, who is a second-year graduate student doing inorganic synthesis on the air-sensitive cobalt complex, cobalt tetricus 35 bis trifluoromethyl phenyl borate 2. Jing started working in the lab about a year ago, and her second-year qualifying exam is in three weeks. Jing has some good results, but needs to do some cyclic voltammetry experiments on her complex before her exam. Jing's group is pretty large, and they have labs and offices in different buildings. Despite the size of the group, they only have one potentiostat to share that lives on a cart that gets passed between labs and offices. After securing some time with the potentiostat using the group's online instrument calendar, Jing wheeled the cart to her glove box. With a little help from her lab mate, she got the potentiostat set up and was ready to start running cyclic voltammetry experiments. Unfortunately, right from the start, Jing noticed a huge amount of noise on her voltammograms. She asked her lab mate for help, but they didn't know what was going on or how to fix it. Jing was getting very nervous for her qualifying exam. What was Jing going to do? Skip her qualifier, run away, start a new life as a beekeeper in the woods of Alaska. That's what she's going to do. I hear it's actually quite lucrative, and it involves no electrochemistry, so (laughs) win-win. Why why beekeeper? I am somewhat terrified of bees, although they always make me think of the 2006 horror film written and directed by Neil uh, Labout and starring Nicolas Cage, The Wicker Man. Not that I saw the movie, but I saw the memes. Is that the one where talking about? Is that, is, that, is that the one where <laughs> Nick Cage has his head in that box and they like pour bees on him and he's just like screaming incoherently for an hour? <laughs> Not incoherently, very specifically, in a way that is hilarious and no one would ever scream like that. <laughs> I think that's like every movie he's in. He's just an absolute lunatic in every single movie. I find it hilarious. Although I did love it when he stole the Declaration of Independence. Oh yeah, national treasure. What isn't a national treasure, though, is the qualifying exam. It's a nervous, anxiety-filled adventure crammed into a few months, uh, once you know your exam date, at least. Yeah, that sure is. Although I will say that the qualifying exam really depends on, like, where you go to grad school. Mine was honestly not that bad, but I think the format, uh, for at least for me anyway, was different from other people in most major universities. Seems like Jing's not really getting off quite so easy here, and, uh, you know, she's going to have to keep her wits about her to figure out this electrochemistry glove box nightmare. What was your qualifying exam experience like? I don't, like, I come from a chemistry background, so I don't know what, like, chemical engineering uh, qualifying exams are like. Yeah, I don't know. They might be different. I mean, from chemistry and chemical engineering, I guess they must be. But, uh, you know, we only really get our own departmental experiences, right? Like whatever major we're in. So mine was actually pretty unique. Um, they used to have a written exam like some years before, but I guess they decided to abandon it either the year before I got there or maybe even that same year that when I you know started grad school. So instead, what they had is the part of the, you know, quote unquote qualifying exam was just my performance in the three core chemical engineering classes that I took in the first um, you know, semester or two. And so they figured that like an extended time frame with regular coursework was a better gauge of your subject mastery. And while you know, I don't personally mind tests that much, but I, I think it was an interesting take on things, you know, just a little bit different. Um, the actual qualifying exam itself for me, I was assigned a random publication just like by any professor, any group, and tasked with preparing a presentation on its contents. I basically had to pretend it was my own research and present it as such, mainly because, like, as I said, I spent my first, you know, semester or two just doing coursework, so I had, like, no research of my own yet. Um, And so basically I had to read this, you know, random publication thoroughly and go down the references rabbit hole to, like, know this paper and its references inside and out. It was actually a pretty cool way to prepare us for what defending your own research ends up being like. What was yours like? That's very interesting. So so my exam consisted of a written component and an oral component, and I needed to present around the end of my second year. So my presentation was on the research that I had done for – you know, I only had about one year of research experience at that point. 
because um, I was also just like taking courses during my first year. But probably the hardest part of my qualifying exam was scheduling three professors to meet in the same room for like at the same time for two hours. And even then, it didn't seem like it was enough because, and I remember this vividly, I was walking down the hall and I saw a friend of mine. We were, we were talking about scheduling our qualifying exam and we had, uh, we actually had a few of the same committee members and literally he was like, yeah, I've got Joe on my committee. And I was like, yeah, he's on my committee too. My qualifying exam is on May 17th. Uh, and he's like, yeah, my, mine's on May 17th too. And I'm like, oh, cool. Mine's at like 2 PM. What time is yours? And at that point there was this like sudden pause and look of terror on my friend's face. And he's like, mine is at 2 PM as well. And then I said, oh, man, let's go talk to this professor just like right now and just <laughs> clear up. You know, clearly he had somehow double bulked our qualifying exam. And and it was just random chance that we bumped into each other to discover this and, and fix this problem. <sighs> so, yeah, hardest part of the qualifying exam is getting a bunch of busy professors together. Yeah. I think this is known as the Schrodinger Heisenberg Professor Uncertainty Principle. It states that you can never know the exact location of more than one professor at the same time, only that they prob the probability that they may exist. We just we can't know for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And and while the qualifying exam is a bit nerve wracking, I have come to understand its purpose um, a lot better over the years. Really. A good qualifying exam, at least from my perspective, is that the professors, they're really trying to make sure that you're working on a project that can actually be completed by the end of your PhD. And the really, really hard questions that they ask is really just to get you to think about your system in different ways to help you avoid certain like pitfalls. Well, now I know that you're just making crap up. Did I really just hear you use the phrase, quote, a project that can be actually completed by the end of the PhD? Like, did... Did your school also take you on a trip to Scotland to see the Loch Ness Monster and, you know, interview Bigfoot and ride a unicorn over a rainbow? I assume your PhD is in things that don't exist. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good point. But I, uh, I remember somebody saying, like, yeah, I'm working on an ultra-fast spectroscopy project to detect this molecule. And the professor on the qualifying exam committee mentioned the lifetime of such a molecule only exists, like, one in ten years. So you couldn't possibly complete this project, you know, uh, or, or something along those lines. Just one of the professor's reality distortion fields gets countered by another reality <laughs> distortion field, maybe just canceling them out. Yeah. Well, I hope distortion fields, you know, they didn't completely cancel each other out. So that would mean you were left with like something resembling data, you know, right before your qualifying exam. True, true. I did have some data, which was, which was very helpful. Uh, but it wasn't, you know, a deal breaker. So hopefully Jing shouldn't stress out too much about getting the CV data before the exam. But the problem still needs to be addressed. Yeah. All right. So let's get to it then. So what is her electrochemical system? And, uh, you know, why does she even need a glove box in the first place, I should ask? Let's see. So Jing is working in a non-aqueous electrolyte solution of 0 0.1 molar tetrabutyl ammonium hexafluorophosphate. Uh, in acetonitrile with a platinum wire counter electrode, a five millimeter gold working electrode with her molecule, cobalt tetricus 35 bis trifluoromethyl phenyl borate 2. And uh, she has a quasi reference electrode, which is a silver wire, and she's added ferrocene as an internal standard. So generally speaking, you want to do non-aqueous electrochemistry uh, in a glove box, you know, where there's no oxygen, there's no water. Uh, and while I'm not sure, you know, for sure, I, we're pretty sure her molecule is air sensitive too. Hey, so does that mean if you're doing electrochemistry on the moon, you'd, you'd need a glove box to do aqueous stuff? Like the environment's <laughs> naturally oxygen and water free. So, so that means that like the moon is the ideal location for non-aqueous electrochemistry. <laughs> Somewhere out there, there's a non-breathing alien cursing the vacuum, you know, that their vacuum uh, system, that they got <laughs> vacuum in their water oxygen box while working on the oxygen reduction reaction. That would be interesting if like aliens learn science in like the opposite manner that we do, just like physiologically, you know, just because of the world that we live in. Yeah, exactly. It's, I mean, it's like when you were a kid and you played that game where, you know, you called it opposite day with your friends. So it's like 
you know, your friend would be like, you're dumb. And you'd be like, no, it's opposite day. So you just said I'm smart. And then they'd be like, oh, well, you're smart. And you just go like, thank you. Right. <laughs> that was totally a thing. Or maybe just me. I don't know. So in this opposite day alien world, which would be human world because it's opposite. I, I don't know. here. Does, but does that mean that noise is good for electrochemistry data? Because it's opposite day. So I wonder what Jing thinks about this insane and impossible to follow line of thinking that I'm currently rambling about. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, opposite alien day or not, noise is still noise. And it's a problem for Jing's CV experiment. Uh, first, I think it's not uncommon to get noise in your CV day, though, when you're working in a glove box. However, we don't know exactly what kind of noise Jing is experiencing. Like, is it just background noise over the entire voltammogram? Or is she getting like really jagged, crazy noise in a specific region of the voltammogram? I mean, I've seen both. Yeah, and, and there's also other ways that like CV noise can show itself. So sometimes it's related to like the current ranges with the potentiostat. Um, you know, just when there's a random peak or sudden change in current as you sweep. Sometimes it's just random and all encompassing kind of like if you left a two year old in a room with a red pen and told them to go bananas on the walls, you know, that kind of noise. Uh, but sometimes it might occur sort of evenly throughout the whole scan, like you mentioned. Um, you know, if that's the case, you can sometimes do some special analysis to check the like the frequency of the signal that's on top of the data. Yeah, yeah. So in in the case in that case where there is background noise across the entire voltammogram. And what it tends to look like is a small sine wave or like just consistent oscillations superimposed across the voltammogram. What you can do is you can take a fast Fourier transform of the data and that will produce a peak associated with the frequency of the noise. Uh, one common source of noise is uh, room lights because it's just electromagnetic radiation that the potentiostat can pick up. Okay, so for the room lights to affect her electrochemistry, then I would guess that Jing's cobalt tetrakis 35 bis trifluorochloromethylphenyl alkyl benzyl borate tripotassium nitrate 2 molecule, where like some part of her experiment would have to be, you know, somewhat photosensitive. Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely a possibility. And it wouldn't be too hard to try electrochemistry in the dark. Yeah, exactly. You know, turn the lab lights off, light some candles, whip up a nice dinner. It's a real romantic night with your electrochemistry experiment. That's just what Jing needs to, you know, get rid of that pesky noise problem. <laughs> Oh, cobalt tetricus 2, 8, bis dimethyl, phenyl alkyl, benzoamine, monosodium glutamate 2. You're so funny. I want to hear more about your trip to the NMR. Well, my teachers really believe in my potential, but right now they say I'm the class clown making too much noise. Get, get it? Get it? <laughs> but um, Tish. <laughs> oh, that was a good one. That was an excellent, excellent dad joke right there. Well, I do suppose that if the cobalt tetricus 4, 7, bis, disulfyl, furfural, isoleucenic, creatine, tetrafluoroborate 2 it really is part of the noise problem, whether it's this you know periodic or random kind of noise, Jing really – well, theoretically, I should say, should be able to whittle it down by doing like a dummy cell test at the very least in her glove box, you know, possibly with the lights off for extra romance. <laughs> the dummy cell might not be as good a romantic partner as a cobalt tetricus 13 bis trimethoxy imidazolium dichlorohydrate 2. Because, well, for those who are listening and have never heard of a dummy cell, a dummy cell is just a circuit that is used to test whether a potentiostat is working or not. For example, a very simple test is to use a resistor as a dummy cell, like a one kilo ohm resistor. So for a cyclic voltammetry experiment, you should get a straight diagonal line for your CV, where you have current versus potential, where the slope is equal to the resistance of your dummy cell resistor. This is good for isolating whether it's a potentiostat problem or a chemical system problem when you're troubleshooting. So, Neil, what were the dummy cell results? Well, actually, surprisingly here, the dummy cell results were pretty uneven and noisy still. And that, that same kind of, you know, superimposed background noise that Jing saw with her cobalt tetricus 93 bis glycolic oxyparahydrochloric barium phenyl triglyceride 2 CV test before. So, you know, it was about as romantic as Meg Ryan falling for a guy over AOL email in the early days of the Internet. I think Jing is just frustrated and, you know, may not be taking the dummy cell out on the second date anytime soon. Did you just reference 1998 romantic comedy directed by Nora Ephron and starring Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, You've Got Mail? Yes, in fact, I did. Who would have thought that movie was you know, actually ahead of its time? I guess everybody meets each other online using their phone these days. 
Uh, but nobody actually looks another human or dummy cell in the eye anymore and you know, just has a conversation. <laughs> I know. It's a serious problem, especially among uh, amongst electrochemists. I had this problem too, but luckily I spoke to my doctor about socializing. I was diagnosed with electrochemical performance dysfunction or EPD. It's incredible. You know, preliminary results show socializing improved my brain function, cognitive reasoning, and self-esteem just after two weeks of use. Side effects of socializing have been making friends, increased blood alcohol level, strong desire to watch sporting events, and lower blood pressure. Now, I've got to make a disclaimer. Socializing for EPD is one of our sponsors, so I get paid every time I mention socializing to anyone. Do I get royalties for mentioning socializing too? I don't know. But you should speak to your doctor to find out if socializing is right for you. Wow. Thanks, Alex. I can't wait to see how socializing is going to transform my life, too. Jing might be suffering from early onset EPD. We might want to recommend she speak to her doctor to see if socializing is right for her. Damn, I should just get, like, a, a lot from our sponsor for this. <laughs> but enough, uh, enough, enough product placement. What should Jing do next? Yeah, well, I agree. I mean, no more product placement. So what Jing should really do is contact Pine Research to purchase a brand new, fully equipped WaveNow wireless potentiostat, which is the ideal system when doing wireless electrochemistry in a glove box. But, you know, to be fair, if she can't do that, <laughs> at least the next step is to recognize that since the dummy cell tests in the glove box were still noisy, there definitely seems to be a problem like with electronics, cabling, or, you know, hardware of some kind. Okay, so... We know that it's not a chemical issue with nic with nickel tetricus 35 bis trifluoromethyl phenyl borate 2, but an issue with just the hardware. The next question I have is, is how is the potentiostat set up in the glove box? I know Jing was working with a lab mate, but I don't know if the potentiostat is inside the glove box or outside the glove box with like cell cables inside or the cell cable is connected to pins on the back. All right. Well, you mentioned at the beginning about how, you know, this one potentiostat her lab has is on that cart. So she doesn't have the ability to put the potentiostat inside the glove box. She's got, you know, the cell cable from the potentiostat connected to some pins on a feed through on the outside of the glove box. And then there's these separate cables inside that reach the setup where her manganese tetracus 3,5-bis tri-di tetrapoly monoborate 2 molecule is. Oh, that might be a problem. So you might not know this, but the cell cable on your potentiostat is shielded. There is a wire that's inside the cell cable. That's the drive line that feeds the signal you want to apply your potential or your current. Then outside of that is some insulating material that's followed by a conductive metal coating that is driven at the same potential as the drive line. This acts as a shield from outside electrical interference. When you connected the cell cable to the pins on a feed through, you break the shield and there is now more exposed wires that act as antennas for electrical noise. All I could think about from what you said about shields and insulating is Captain America wearing a very warm overcoat. <laughs> Do you think Captain America's shield also suffers, you know, from an electrical noise problems? Probably not. I mean, didn't that shield like block Thor's lightning or something? Well, actually, according to Marvel movie canon, Thor's hammer strike energy was diverted around the shield and then into the ground where it dissipated harmlessly. Don't you even know anything about science? Oh, so Captain America's shield is grounded. Yes, exactly. Captain America knows all about Faraday cages and grounding strategies so that his batteries are the least noisy things in the universe. Oh, it's a shame he had to do all that fighting to save the universe. He'd probably be a good electrochemist. No, no, no. You're thinking about Iron Man. He's the one who invents all that stuff. He uses nanotech to build suits and weapons and all kinds of stuff. Again, I don't even think you're a real scientist considering how little you know. Yeah, I stopped paying attention to Marvel movies after Endgame. I think Endgame was a solid conclusion, and they should just go do uh, other things. Yeah, it, it definitely was. I actually, I actually completely agree. And also, just to make this perfectly clear to everyone listening, yes – Yes, I am absolutely equating knowledge of the Marvel Cinematic Universe with being a good scientist. They are exactly the same thing. I mean, how did Tony Stark escape from the cave? How does IR compensation work? That, that was all in the same class in college. <laughs> well, this electrochemistry in the MCU class, it really seems to have covered the basics of grounding. But, you know, did it go into detail about why that's necessary? You know, what is it about glove boxes or other pla you know, pieces of equipment that are adding this kind of electrical noise that's being picked up because, you know, the shielding thing that you mentioned before? 
So glove boxes have electrical power. There's also a mechanical pump to remove air. The glove box also has lights inside of it. Sometimes some labs put other instruments inside of a glove box, like you know, a, a weighing scale. So all these electronic and instrument-related things can create electric noise that a potential stack can pick up. And let's not forget that other instruments that just might be near the, you know, on a bench near the glove box um, might be like physically vibrating or have their own electrical noise. So vibrations can also be picked up by the electrochemical signal. Okay, so then I think the first troubleshooting option that Jing needs to try is to like turn a bunch of stuff you know, that's in or near the glove box off and then try running the CV again. You know, this might remove the noise or at least like some of it if those, you know, electromagnetic or vibrational sources are a major contributor, you know, to the noise problem. Another solution would be to put the potential stat inside the glove box. I know there are some technical barriers, but there are some potential stats that can communicate with a computer wirelessly and don't require any extra feed throughs. This is one way to make sure that the shield on the cell cable doesn't get broken. Exactly, just you know, just like all of that not at all shameful product plug that I was mentioning earlier about our Wave Now wireless potential stat. Did, <laughs> did I mention that it's ideal for glove box and experiments? Yeah, I mean, you might even say that they were designed for glove box use. Wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> Jing's and, and you know, Jing's lab is pretty big, you know, and they only have one potential stat that floats around on a cart. Maybe if they bought an inexpensive WaveNow wireless, they wouldn't run into this problem in the first place. Exactly. You know, and in fact, I would say to your first point that the WaveNow wireless is designed for glove box use. You are correct. So, you know, we're agreed. Jing needs a WaveNow wireless. But, you know, to be fair, just in case she doesn't get one of those, she can't convince her, you know, boss to buy one. Another option that we've seen uh, is basically like sealing the cell cable through a hole in the glove box using something like, you know, like epoxy. And, you know, that way there's no breaking of the shield or extra connection. But the downside, of course, is that that potentiostat is, like, completely stuck in that glove box. It's no longer, you know, can be used for anything besides glove box test. Glove box test, but unless, you know, you get another, like, a whole separate cell cable. Yeah, yeah. The last thing I can think of to try to improve or to, to remove noise is to play around with either the grounding configuration of the potentiostat setup uh, but you can also play with the filter settings to try to remove noise. Sometimes you can remove noise through changing hardware or software fil filters. Yeah, yeah, this feels like an episode of Scooby Doo, where you know they pull off the mask at the you know the bad guy at the end to reveal who was behind it all along. Except like in Jing's case, you know it wasn't the dummy cell, it wasn't her you know cesium tetricus one twelve bis fluorochloroboro iodine two molecule. It was like forty five other things. You know she pulls off the mask and reveals it's like this. Hydra with like a million heads. It's the electrical connection. It's the grounding. It's the lights, the filters. It's the vibrating pump. It's like, I kind of feel bad for Jing here because like while she has the direction now to start troubleshooting with all these things that we just you know suggested, it, it's really just unfortunate there isn't one simple answer. True. Although I do suspect that as she starts testing the system, like without lights, you know, with lights on, with lights off. Uh, with different grounding configurations, she'll start to see noticeable improvements in her data. And like, yeah, it might not be just one thing, but each thing she corrects for will improve her data and perhaps improve it to the point that it's good enough for her qualifying exam. Or as I suggested originally, she can just, you know, skip town and start that whole Alaskan beekeeping thing. I really still think that's a better option. Alaskan beekeeping or electrochemistry. Either way, Jing, I hope your iron complex research goes well, and we wish you the best of luck in Alaska. And now, a word from our sponsors. I used to feel like there was a metric ton of sodium chloride on my chest, weighing me down all the time. My copper nitrate solution just wasn't even blue anymore. I used to feel excitement whenever I saw a peak from my LSV experiment, but now I just feel despair. If you're experiencing these kinds of symptoms, you may have a rare but serious condition called Electrochemical Performance Dysfunction, or EPD. People suffering from EPD often find their laboratory research not as fulfilling as it used to be. I constantly overcompensate my IR drop, and my CVs don't look like ducks anymore. I even tried to sit down to write my thesis, but I couldn't even finish the acknowledgments. There may be hope, in the form of a new treatment option, socializing. Preliminary studies show socializing improved brain function, 
cognitive reasoning, and self-esteem after just two weeks of use. Side effects of socializing may include, but are not limited to, making friends, increased blood alcohol level, strong desire to watch sporting events, and lower blood pressure. After socializing, I asked somebody why my experiment wasn't working, and they were like, hey, your instrument isn't turned on. Thanks, socializing. Other human beings are really helpful. Ask your research advisor today if socializing is right for you. Advertisement is a joke for comedy purposes and is not real, nor does it constitute an offer of any kind from Pine Research. Restrictions apply. See terms and conditions for details. Not valid in Alaska, Hawaii, any of the contiguous 48 states, or any country on any of the seven earthly continents, except Antarctica. Contact Pine Research for details, real offers, life advice, or product quotes. Hey everyone, welcome to another exciting game of Password, Electrochemistry Edition. Today, we have two special guests who are part of the Pine Research sales team, Courtney and Tim, who will be joining Neil and I for this game of Password. In the game Password, there are four one-word passwords that we are trying to guess. These four passwords also make up an electrochemical theme that we will need to guess at the end of the game. Now, because we have four people, we will be playing in teams of two. Neil and I will be one team, and Courtney and Tim will be another team. Courtney and I will know the passwords, and it's our job to give a one-word hint to our teammate to help them correctly guess the password. Now, after one team guesses the password incorrectly, the other team has a chance to provide the hint to their partner to correctly guess the password. Whichever team guesses the most passwords correctly gets bragging rights in the office. Now, because this is a podcast, to those who are listening, you will hear uh, the password ahead of time via... The password is... And then you'll hear the teams try to guess the password. All right, Tim, are you ready? I would just like to say that you said I was special, so thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Courtney, are you ready? I am ready. You're also special. You're also special. Neil, are you ready? I am neither ready nor special. All right, let's play some passwords. Okay, so... Courtney, you see what the first password is. The password is Twizzler. I do. Okay, so now you're going to you're going to try to give a hint to Tim to guess the password. Red. And this is electrochemistry themed. Well, the the it's it's electrochemistry. All the words are actually just like common words. For the most and part. then there's apparently but, some theme and that ties theme it together that's, that's related electric to electrochemistry, chemistry. I guess. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was <laughs> introduced as password, the electric electrochemical chem- edition. I think that Alex is lying so, to us. Is that what you think? You know? <clears throat> and I have to take into account my esteemed colleague's clue. Correct. Yes. Yes. So interesting. Red. Anode. All right, yeah. Alex. Okay, let's okay. Go, let's all go. right, all right. I think I think this should help. Candy. Huh. Well, no. All I can think of is candy cane, but that doesn't make red make any sense. It's a one-word candy. answer. Right, it's a one-word. Red and candy. A lot harder. Yeah, this is <laughs> harder than I thought it was going to be. I really, yeah, I... Uh. <clears throat> oh, my. Red and candy. Cinnamon. No. Okay, no, I can okay. think it's cinnamon right, candy. Let's, I don't know. Right. Chewy. Red. Chewy. What was your clue? Candy. Starburst. No. That is all of those things. That's a red <laughs> chewy candy. Yes. <laughs> all right, we're getting it's we're true. getting very close. All right, I I think I think Neil I think you can get this. You, that you have more confidence than me, but go ahead. Okay. Twist. I mean. Twizzler. Correct. Okay. I like the kid. Yeah. Okay, wait. Okay. One, moment. <laughs> <laughs> One moment here. Not that Starburst was any more or less electrochemistry related, <laughs> but okay. explain. Look, okay, don't, okay, be, no. don't be jelly, the, okay? The, the words... You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a board gamer. <laughs> okay. I'm real into rules. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, <laughs> okay. No. Okay, so all the passwords, because, like, you know, I, when I came up with the passwords, the passwords themselves are not necessarily electrochemical in nature but at the end the theme the theme that we'll guess based on those passwords will be electrochemical okay and and i'm gonna i'll I'll tell you that you know the you may have to 
stretch the imagination a little bit when you look when you get all the passwords <clears throat> and you're trying to think about the theme you're trying to think like well we can talk about episode one when we did password we had things like um we had things like coin wedding uh twister like those are some of the passwords but the the theme was rrde it was like rotating ring disc electrochemistry the coin was like a disc a wedding had like like a ring and then twister is like spinning okay i'm waiting so, with baiting i'm waiting with bated breath I'm okay ready. <laughs> okay all right okay. i sense sarcasm on this side <laughs> a little bit okay Did you already get our words the i got next... the first i don't know the words no but when we give to them what do you mean? Or we're not going back and forth. No, no, no. They're only asking us. Oh. Because yeah. we don't know the words. I don't know the words. You guys aren't a team. We're a team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Carry on. The password is copper. All right. So my hint to Neil for the second password is penny. Cent. No. Huh. I can Metal. Also- I believe the password is copper. Yes, that's ah, correct. That's, that's got to be. That's good. <laughs> I literally yes. heard Penny and was like, "Yeah, that's don't Penny. say it. Don't say it." <laughs> and you didn't mine. say it, and I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, Phew, I'm Should've... pretty sure I got this." One. Okay, good. Well, now look I'll... at you. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's why you got the advantage going second. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was thinking like it can't be something metally, you know, whatever, because it's like not. <laughs> Sciency, right? right Twi- Twizzler's way. not science. Copper has nothing to do with There's electrochemistry. No, none. Zero. No <laughs> right. That's why it couldn't be copper. It so, couldn't be. Yeah. Zero chance. <laughs> okay. The password is circle. Round. There are a lot of round things. There are. There's fruits, people, <laughs> ovals. <laughs> Balloons. You should say one of them so the game can proceed. <laughs> See, I'm no, trying I'm to think <laughs> ahead. Twizzler, <laughs> copper. Right, there's a theme here. What is a round thing that relates these? A person. Clearly. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> it must be. Uh-huh. A ball. No. That's what I would have guessed. Okay. <clears throat> All right, my, so my hint, Neil. Yep. Shape. Circle. Yes. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, yeah second second person definitely has yes, a huge advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> Somehow we went four on the first one, though. Well, was, if I had started well, yeah, shape. Well, yeah. well Twizzler yeah. was a bit more obscure. A little yeah, bit. Twizzler's a bit, a a bit obscure. Bit, definitely a bit, a bit obscure. Bit, yeah. Okay. Um, so we have the last password, and then we have to put this magical pieces of a puzzle together. The password is... Bow. Decoration. Know? So, you know, I, I got to do the Tim thing in filibuster for 10 minutes to think about the other words. You know, it's good fodder for the podcast. You know what? <laughs> you don't know anything about podcasts. You'll take, I know what's going to happen. Something one of us says is going to be extracted and used. Against us in a court yes. of law? Yes. That's right. That's good. I, I have had that happen in every one of my webinars, like when I said the inductance is meaningless, and then that's just the, the thing I'm most known for. So. <laughs> So we have Twizzler, and I've already forgotten the other two, and I forgot what word you said. So, so I, so the hint I gave you was <laughs> oh, decoration. Decoration, right? So we had, we had Twizzler, Circle, and Copper. Yeah. <clears throat> I know the theme. Oh well, that's not fair. Just because you're more clever than me. No. Um. <clears throat> let's see. <laughs> yeah, there's no way I'm gonna get this. So yeah, you might as well just do your word. Uh, party. No, oh. Okay. You said party? Party. No. Okay, I don't know. How's that a decoration? Because you put decorations at a party. Oh, okay. See? Um, yeah. Your word is hair. Oh, now Tim's confused. <laughs> he thought he had it. No, no. I think I might know what all of these words oh, are the going theme? towards. Oh, I didn't know okay. your so word. So remember yeah. his was? Decoration yeah. and hair. Hmm. Scrunchy. Oh, sorry. That's not my turn. <laughs> <laughs> Also, the eighties called. <laughs> <laughs> they want their banana clip back. <laughs> Those aren't in style anymore. No, is that not a thing? Look, you you act like I know fashion. You know, really. Oh yeah, <laughs> Courtney, are banana clips even remotely popular anymore? Wait, scrunchies got a be banana negative. clip. Is that a thing? That'd be negative. There's also scrunchies. I don't know. Scrunchies are functional. That's a different thing. That's an elastic, right? No, but the, came back. the big yeah, decorative okay. ones See? came back, like all the colors yes. and the yeah, oh. yeah. 
I shows like what I know. Not the crazy one. Um. Okay. Decoration and hair. Clip. No. That was close. Um. Scrunchy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ribbon. Oh. Really don't. Scrunchy is my answer. I have no idea. Okay. I hope to okay. answer. I don't know. You, you it's, not it's not scrunchy. It's not scrunchy. Man, Christmas. I'm so close. Bo. That's ah. correct. Man. It's all good. Hair it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hair all all <laughs> yeah. of your clues make sense. Yeah. It was the two coupled with yeah. ribbon that made me go ding, 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 ding. See, this is to, the, good, yeah. this is to the point that I don't know fashion stuff. Yeah. I'm like, what do people put in their hair? I don't know. I guess a bow is an answer. A bow, bow is an answer. Should have known that. Okay, so, <clears throat> so the four passwords are Twizzler, Copper, Circle, and Bow. What is you know, a little bit of a stretch of the imagination, but what's the electrochemistry theme associated with Tim? Okay. I feel like I know. You feel like you know. Okay. And if I'm wrong, then you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. You're right. I think we might be talking about an inductive loop. Holy moly. Yes. Oh, yes. An inductive oh, loop. <clears throat> Yo, you got it. And you know what it was? Oh, it was yeah. the Twizzler. Yeah. 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 It was the twisty. The braiding. So, okay, oh. we had Twizzler and copper. I'm like, clearly we're talking about wire. Braided, yeah. twisted wire. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a loop. And then a bow is the loops. Yeah. Did I get it right? You got it right. You oh got it gosh. right. You won the game. You have the bragging rights. And I was thinking, like, Anil will get this. It's like my, you know, tr- this is trigger. My, this is the this is Alex's least, <laughs> favorite, like thing least favorite thing in the world. Favorite thing in the world. Inductive loops. Inductive he hates loops. them because they're garbage and they don't mean you anything. Got it yeah, right. they just add that little curly cue at the end of the squiggle. It's either at the beginning or the end. You know what? <laughs> either. <laughs> Did you have to correct me? Can I just have this? No. No. You oh. won the game. Congratulations. I get to correct you on the squiggle science. Oh, uh-huh. yeah. That mm-hmm. was great. Fair enough. Oh, man. Well, that was that was exciting. Uh, uh, thank you all for, uh, for joining us for a fun game of Passwords. And stay tuned for the next episode of the Electrochemistry Podcast.